seated. Well, amen. Thank you. If you would, turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Uh, 1 Corinthians. And uh, do pray for Tad and Chatty. Pray for Chatty this week. Has another doctor's appointment. And, and uh, if you've heard, Adeline is... Uh, flipped herself over so she's breech right now and they're going to try to turn her and uh, so with the procedure but uh, it'll be at the hospital so pray for her pray that Adeline will turn that she'll straighten up quit acting like her grandma and uh, um, and uh, her mom and just do right uh, but no pray for them if you would and again pray for the doctors and nurses we're excited but uh, praying for God's perfect will. First Corinthians chapter 15, thinking about this week and, and uh, the significance of this week for us. Um, we celebrated our uh, 33rd wedding anniversary on Friday. And on our 13th wedding anniversary, we moved here. And uh, it has been 20 years that we have been here. And I was looking at the first, trying to find the first message that I preached. And uh, I couldn't find it. Probably a good thing that I couldn't find it. Um, and uh, But thinking about God's people, the church. What is the church? The church is not a building. The church is not a name. The church is people that are part of that building, part of that organization, the church. And thinking about this church, New Hope Baptist Church. And how good God has been. But looking at how things have changed throughout the last years. And especially the last uh, five, ten years. And how much has changed in society. You know, we're living in an age where it seems like everyone is seeking after something. Uh, They want something. Something better. Something to improve their life. You look at uh, young people. They're trying to establish their place in life. I was at my uh, nephew's wedding this, this weekend, got married on Saturday and, or on Friday, and we, we traveled back from mid-Iowa, uh, central Iowa yesterday, and, and listening to him talk in his youth and, and all of his big plans, and, and, and I finally said to him, I said, listen, just quit talking because you have no clue what you're entering into. And uh, I said, this is going to be the greatest time of your life. But he's talking about his future and what's going to happen and what's going to take place. You know, for youth, they're looking at establishing a place in their life. Many young adults are seeking secure, stable employment and beginning a family. Uh, Many who are middle-aged are seeking financial freedom and uh, security. The older generation, we're trying to seek uh, new ways to feel younger or feel better and uh, uh, trying to look at and enjoy the simple things of life. Now, these are all normal phases that uh, people go through. And Solomon talks about it from a baby all the way through uh, the elderly and how things progress and then they regress and how uh, when you hit this age, you revert back to this age. And, and, And everybody is seeking something in life. The troubling thing is in today's society is that few ever find the things that they're hoping for that brings real peace and contentment. Folks, we are living. How many are thankful for what took place on Friday? I'm thankful for what took place, but when we heard the news early that morning, my wife and I wept. We said it was a sad day in our country. Thankful for Roe versus Wade. It was unconstitutional to start with. Never should have been voted on. But I wept because of listening to religious leaders. Talking about that women have a right to their bodies. And politicians have no right to intervene. I would agree that politicians don't have a right to intervene. But let me say this. Women do not have a right to their body. Neither do men have a right to their body. Especially Christians. We belong to God. 
We've been bought with a price. We belong to God. The fact is, it's still murder. You kill a baby and you listen to the left and you listen to what they're saying and listen to what they're doing. And, and I will say this if I was going to, but uh, put it on Facebook, but I knew I wouldn't. And, and I try to be politically kind and so I don't post stuff, but I was going to ask, and, and it's out there if you're listening, if you are a Democrat and agree uh, that uh, abortion should be legal, please remove me from your Facebook friend and remove me completely from your list. It's murder. It's what it is. You see, the reason we can't find contentment is we're trying to find it without God. We're trying to find it without the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, finding a place in life, starting a family, landing a good job, reaching financial uh, independence, even seeking a better health are all good things. But apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, it's vain. And I think of the church and I think of what God has done in 20 years and, and in 40 some years of the church and what is God going to do in the future is going to be dependent upon what we do. As I mentioned here a few weeks ago, preaching on the home, if you want to look at uh, the home, look at society, because society is a reflection of what is taking place in the home and what is being taught in the home. You know, this movement, you may disagree with me, that's fine, but bring your proof, I'll bring my proof of what the humanistic agenda is uh, to our young people. A school in Michigan was hiding in junior high, elementary school, or middle school, I should say, that's what they said, uh, the transition of, of their, uh, the, their, their son to become a daughter. And they're hiding it from the parents, the transition. That's wrong. And uh, I, I will say more about that later, but there's an argument there as well. My whole point is this, if we want to see God move in a great way in the next 20 years, we need to follow God's word. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 51, it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For the corruptible must put on incorruption, and the mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain, in the Lord. If you look at this verse, the three or four, four words here, steadfast, unmovable, always abounding. If you have a habit of underlining, underline that those words, steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You know, the prayer, you look around and you see all the young people, and there's young people down in junior church, and, and uh, uh, it, it's what a privilege it is to see uh, the children growing up in the church and becoming young adults, and, and, and you see their lives, and you see the changes in their lives. It's exciting to see all of that. But if we want those young people and these young people to turn out, we need to be steadfast, unmovable, Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Doesn't matter what society says. Doesn't matter what the world says. We have a responsibility. You know, you could secure everything that the world attributes to as success and still not find joy. You say, well, listen, I know people that aren't in church, people that aren't saved that are happy. I'm not saying they don't have some happiness in their life, but they will never have fulfillment in their life. They will never have true peace in their life. 
every one of them, when they get older and they come to the edge of eternity and they, uh, to the time where they're going to leave this world, they don't have that peace and assurance. Aren't you glad you know you're saved? Not only know, but to, to, to know that if, if Christ were to return, my nephew, my one nephew, he said, he said, Uncle Ted, he said, I just realized is, and my parents, we, uh, my brother and, and his wife and my wife and I and my father and, his, and my mother, we went to, to Iowa and my nephew said, he said, listen, Uncle Ted, you need to drive really carefully home. The whole farm is in that vehicle right there. The whole farm is there. All the names on the farm is there. And I said, well, I said, I will try to drive carefully. But if God takes us home, have fun. And, uh, uh, but we look at fulfillment in life. If God were to have taken us home and we were not to have made it here, I'm satisfied with what God has done in my life. Now, when we look at this passage of Scripture here this morning, it is possible to abound in the Lord. It is possible to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the Lord. It is possible to enjoy His peace and contentment regardless of circumstances going on. Folks, I, I believe we're going to see things take place in our country this next year. And if God tarry His coming in the years to come that we would never and could never imagine but let me give you some peace. God's still on the throne. He's never left his position from eternity past to present time to eternity future. God's still in control of everything. Now, I look at this. I, I, do, I, I have to because it, it won't leave my mind unless I say it. You know, in verse, in verse 52, it, it is funny, uh, this, this phrase. I, every time I read it, I think of this. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last Trump, and I can't help but think of the rightful president, Trump, here, and what he did for our country and nation, and uh, not perfect, but uh, what the former, or the, I guess you wouldn't call him former, I guess you would call him the uh, puppet who's in office today, but I don't want to get away from the message Looking at this, let me give you three things. First of all, the relationship of the believer. This is what is exciting about verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The relationship of the believer, clearly relationships play key roles in our life. Brandon and Autumn, uh, they're, they're celebrating their seventh anniversary today. And happy anniversary. Uh, it's a relationship that started. I asked Marcy, how long have you been married? And, and I have to say, she didn't hesitate. She said, 11 years. Gideon, you just celebrated anniversary. How many years? Four. I gave you time to think about that. You're welcome. <laughs> but no, they just celebrated their anniversary and we could go around. And Brother Steve said ours is going to be seven times seven. And that's not common core, that's actual math and or division. Uh, uh, 49 years coming up in, in, in marriage. And, and, but relationships play an important role. Not just marital, but friendships play important roles in our lives. And so in this, the believer has a special one. In our relationship, in the relationship of the believer, we can look at our assurance. The word therefore, as Adrian Rogers comments, Paul is referring to the previous things that are written down. When you come to a word and the start of that verse is therefore, you always have to go back and look at the verses previously because Paul is talking about these verses that are previous to what he is saying in this verse here. You know, he just has given one of the greatest discourses on our hope and assurance of life beyond the grave. Notice 1 Corinthians 51 and, uh, through 53 here. 
It says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Then look at verse 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have victory in life because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. We're not on the winning side. We're on the side that's already won. But you look at the relationship here. We are not a people that lack hope. We do not live in a hopeless state of being. We have hope in our lives. We have the assurance of better things to come. Listen, we may never achieve all of the things we hoped for in life. We may never accomplish the things in life. I said to my nephew and and, uh, niece to, to, to be, I said, listen, one of the greatest things you can do is set some goals in your life. They were in a room, we were talking, I said, set some goals, have a one-year goal, have a five-year goal, have a 10-year goal, have a 20-year goal, and reach for and strive for those goals. I have goals in my life, and, and many I've achieved, and there's many that I haven't. But I may never achieve them all, but I have a blessed hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. One of these days, the greatest thing is going to take place. You know, again, we may never secure uh, the greatest of jobs. I believe I did. May not find the financial freedom. We may not do all the things that we desire. Our lives may be filled with suffering and pain. But this is not all there is for the child of God. We have a better life coming. Why? Because of the relationship that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ. Our association, though. I like this as well. Look at verse number 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren. Now, they are not just acquaintances that he met. He said they're brethren. All of us, you know, sometimes we confuse acquaintances with friends. I have many acquaintances that aren't my friends. But all of us have some close friends But we also have relatives, family. He says, my dearly beloved brethren, therefore my beloved brethren. Now, they are not just people that he has shared some time with on occasion. They are counted as brethren. They are more than just friends. They are part of a family. If you are brethren, I I took a trip this week with my brother, and we went to Iowa, as I just mentioned. But in this, they're more than just friends, they are part of the family. They share a special bond. Now listen, I don't know a lot of things in life, but there's a few things I do know. Now, I know we can get in the particulars of all of uh, this, but you know I do know that in order to be brethren, you have to come from the same source. I mean, that's just, that's just common sense. It is not a birthing parent. It's a mother that we come from, a woman. Let me, let me clarify something. Men cannot have babies. They may not be men, but if they're of the male gender, they cannot have babies. That's a scientific fact. I praise the Lord for that too. That would be that would be horrible. Okay, I had one. Now it's your turn. Uh, the closest you say you have no clue what it's like. Uh, the closest I have come to is, is is kidney stones. I do. I can sympathize with you a little bit. Uh, the difference is you get to hold that rotten child. And, well, this too shall pass, the doctor said to me. And, uh, uh, but there's a special relationship. Listen, we must be born of the same mother. You can say, well, you can be of the same father, different mothers. But the only way that, that, that there's an other way of possibility to be brethren is through adoption. 
Now I want you to think about this for just a moment. Praise the Lord, all of the redeemed enjoy both here. We have come through the same womb of salvation. We were all born into the family of God by the blood of Jesus Christ. Also, we too were adopted into His family. God chose to have mercy upon those who deserved really condemnation. We deserved God's judgment And God said, I'll give you a way of salvation. Aren't you glad for the Lord Jesus Christ? Folks, we are brethren in this church. If you're saved, like it or not, you're my brother and sister in Christ. Do you realize that we are closer than a biological relationship? Because you can have a biological brother or sister who's lost and will go to a crisis hell, but we're going to spend all eternity together. Now, it's a wonderful thing if your family is all saved and headed to heaven as well. But we are brethren. We have a special relationship. We are beloved here. That association that we have, we are adopted into the family of God, brethren in the Lord. Now, our affection, it says, therefore, my beloved brother. Now, they weren't just brethren, they were beloved brethren. You see, they held a very special place in the heart of the apostle. There's no doubt that Paul had led several people to Christ, but he's writing the church at Corinth, and he's saying, listen, you are my beloved brethren. Yes, you're going through some things, and some things are happening in your church, but I want you to know that I love you, I care for you, you are my beloved brethren. You see, they held this special place. He cared for them and was concerned. Now, the word beloved has the idea of esteemed, dear, worthy of love. Now this was a special group to Paul. They shared a common bond together. You know, do you realize what you have in the body of Christ in the church? Do you realize what you have here? I think sometimes we take for granted what God has given to us. The closeness, the the prayers that we can share for each other, the concern that we have for each other. You see, you're not just a church. I met some folks for the very first time uh, this, this last few days that are Christians. Some of them are pastors. I'd never met them before. But you know, I missed my church. I missed this place. We have a special relationship here at this church. Last night we just pulled in and, and it started to rain. And a motorcycle went by and it turned around quickly and pulled in front of the church. And I said, I'm sorry, Juan, I'm going to have to say it. My wife said, not me. I said, that looks like Brother Juan. She goes, no, that guy's a little smaller. I'm sorry. She's your sister in Christ. Don't forget that. And so I was on my way up here to the office to check the church and, and uh, bring the computer back up and do some work. And, and so I stepped out the door and there was a gentleman, he was trying to get out of the rain. I said, push your bike underneath the, uh, the awning here so it's not dry as long as it's not leaking. It was a brand new motorcycle. And, uh, and we got to talking about the Lord and, and talking about Christ. And he says, well, I go to a small Baptist church in Battle Creek. He says, some of my families go to a large church. He said, but... You just missed something. Those are his words. I talked to him about salvation. and He said, I know I'm saved. I know I'm on my way to heaven. He was on his way to Holland, and we talked for a few moments, and and, uh, the rain stopped, and he left. There is something about the closeness that you have in a church. You know, I'm thankful for the relationship that I have with this church. I thank God what... He has given us here. And my son has a, uh, I saw the, I was going to get it earlier in a photo album and looking at some pictures. And uh, Brother Larry, we've changed a little bit. Our wives have not. We have changed a little bit. His hair used to be darker. Used to be a little more. My hair used to be darker. 
and I didn't have anything here that I could grow. I mean, I, I used to hate it. I hate it. I used to shave every two weeks. Literally, once. Could you imagine? You're like, you must be in that transition from boyhood to manhood. <laughs> Brother Larry said, well, he finally grew up and became a man. He can grow some hair there. I know it's not the prettiest thing in the world. I'm not talking about my face, but the hair. But hey, <laughs> sorry, you're going to get what, what you have uh, you know, with this. It's, it's like Randy King said, the, he called the other day and he said, I was thinking about this. Listen, if you know Brother Randy King, if he's thinking, you're in trouble. This is 5 o'clock in the morning. He ought to be shot. But I didn't say that on, on, on live stream. He said, I was thinking about this last night, Brother Tad. He said, do you know why you're still at that church? I said, I don't know. I've never brought anything up about this, Brother Randy. He said, because you don't deserve any better. That's why. He said, you know why they keep you around? I said, no, but I think you could tell me. He said, they don't deserve anything better either. He said, have a wonderful morning. Goodbye. I'm like, Really? You know, you couldn't ruin my day by waiting a few hours. You had to do it at 5 o'clock in the morning. Thank you, Brother Randy. Man, I'm thankful for the church that I have. I want you to know that I love each and every one of you. I truly do. Another thing, I know that you love me as well. We're a church. We're a family. We're brethren. And Paul is talking about this, my dearly beloved brethren. Therefore, my beloved brethren, man, God has done so much. God's been so good to us. The relationship that we have, a relationship with Christ, a relationship with each other, relationship here in the church, our affection that we have. Listen, I may not be accepted among the world, but I can come to God's house and find love and acceptance. The world doesn't understand us. The world doesn't uh, want you. We, we were out and, and uh, I was talking to a lady at the church, the, the bride's mother. And uh, uh, there was a bunch of bottles sitting there and it's, it's the caramel and the latte and all this stuff. And then I, I, was, I was going to take cold coffee and put some of this stuff. That's the nastiest stuff in the world. Brother Dale, I wouldn't recommend it. He said, I don't drink coffee. Drank one cup in his life, and he's no more. And I said to him, I said, that looks like beer bottles. And she said, oh, we don't do, we don't, we don't do alcohol here. I said, I know that. I said, I've never touched alcohol in my life. She said, well, I don't know. I said, well, I can tell you, I've never touched alcohol, never touched cigarettes. I've never touched any of those things. To the world, that's strange. I'm not saying if someone has done it that, they're going to die and go to hell. That's not what I'm saying. I praise the Lord. My, I, I was thankful my nephew and his uh, bride, they married pure. They married clean. They'd never touched each other. That's uncommon. When I look at the church, I may not be accepted by the world, but I'm glad I'm accepted here. You may not be accepted by the world, but praise God, you can be accepted in the church. Why? You have a special relationship with each other. The affection here. The second thing is, is also not only the relationship of the believer, but the responsibility of the believer. Now, we've all heard the phrase, membership has its privileges, but it also has its responsibilities. If you are a member, you are responsible. If you call this your church home, you're responsible for some things. You look at the responsibilities as be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Now, this reveals three areas of responsibility. Our conviction. We are called upon to be steadfast. That means to be seated, settled, firmly established. You know, we are to be grounded and settled in our faith. We are to know what we believe, but also why we believe it. Any Christian or so-called Christian that says abortion is okay doesn't know their Bible. It's murder. Let me, let me clarify. My wife and I was talking and 
I have a niece who uh, just went through a miscarriage. You could say she aborted her baby. There's a difference between a mother aborting because of physical problems. A miscarriage is, is really uh, the body rejects it and there's a complications and the body puts it out. That is not the same as having a medical procedure done to end that baby's life. There is a difference. But we were talking about this, uh, what we believe in. We need to know God's word. Listen, the homosexual sodomite movement is sin. It is not accepted anywhere in God's word. Abortion is not accepted anywhere in God's word. It's condemned. You see this in God's word, a conviction. So we seem to encounter much confusion about two things. What is the difference between a conviction and an opinion? You see, our opinions are something that we hold through, uh, we hold as true and right. An opinion. Our convictions are unchanging truths that hold us. An opinion is something that we hold, a conviction is something that holds us. You know, opinions can change, but convictions are unwavering, they are settled. I believe that few in our society have deep, settled convictions anymore. Whatever the opinion is of the world and society, that's exactly what they're going to go. Or the direction, well, uh, you know, society says this is okay. What does God's Word teach? You see, if the church is going to stay strong, if the church is going to be doctrinally correct, we have to have some convictions that we are unworthy and uh, or, or that, that we are unwilling to change or move. I will never, for by the grace of God, I will never accept abortion as right, ever. I will never accept this. 15 letters of the transgender movement. I'll never accept it. It's not normal. The Bible says in Romans 1 that he gave them over to vile affections. In Timothy, it talks about they did that which was unnatural. Those are convictions I'll never change on. A conviction that you must trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And we'll talk about it in, in, in the uh, second service. Do you realize that if you do not believe that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God, you cannot be saved? That's not my words and that's not an opinion. That's a doctrine in God's Word. Folks, we need to be settled on some things. I don't care what they say. I don't care what Maxine Waters and and uh, uh, Pelosi and AOC and all those idiots out there saying that uh, we are going to defy the orders. No, you're defying God because it's wrong. You look at what is talked about in our society, but understand the, the conviction and also the constraint. It says we are to called upon to be unmovable, be steadfast, unmovable. Now, this is closely related to, the, uh, to, to, to being steadfast. Unmovable has the idea of not being moved from a particular place, firmly persistent, motionless. It is simply figuring out where you stand and staying put. What does the Bible say in when you look at, uh, you go into Ephesians and Galatians, it says, uh, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of of the devil and having done all to stand, stand. So a conviction and a doctrinal, uh, doctrines in your life, you're saying, hey, this is what God's word teaches. This is where I'm going to stand and I'm not going to move from it. I'm grounded. Uh, Paul talks to Timothy in the book of Timothy about the pillars of the church. Those unmovable items. You know, we will never be able to stand in one place until we figure out what we're standing on. Do you realize that if you don't know where you stand, the original, uh, the Wizard of Oz, the original, 
and uh, you know she she goes down and and there's the, the 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 split in the road and I hadn't thought about saying this it just came to mind and and uh, uh, well the scarecrow or the the bird or whatever asks this is where are you going and the original has this in it and it says I don't know and the response was then any road will take you to that place if you don't know where you stand then you're going to move. The Bible says, be ye steadfast, unmovable. What are we to be unmovable on? God's holy word. We can't change. I don't care what society says. Where do we stand in God's word? This constraint here. You know, we must first establish our convictions and then refuse to be moved from them. You know, far too many in our day have strayed from the will and ways of God. We are willing to take a stand, and few are for the cause of Christ. Let me say this, standing for Christ is not popular. Standing upon God's Word is not popular. Being an independent Baptist church is not popular. Being a fundamental Baptist church where we believe that God's word is the guideline of our life is not popular, but it's certainly blessed. God blesses this. We must resist the urge to remove from the place that God has instructed us to stand. There are some things that just aren't up for debate. There ought to be some things in your life. And, and young people, you know, the young people around the church, that's why we need to stand strong, uh, us adults. Do you realize that we can help parents? My children are, are growing. They're out of the house. We have a grandbaby on the way. I want, I want my grandbaby to hear from her parents that your grandpa's never changed his stand. He's always stood there. He's never changed. The winds may blow, but I'm going to stand there. A conviction in my life. I look at all the young people and the young people that are down there, down in the fellowship hall. My desire is, is that they will see a church and people that don't change. Now, I'm not saying changing for the good. Do you realize, and I've said this before, you've heard this. The Christian life is not choosing between what is good and bad. Because there is no bad in the Christian life. It's choosing between what is good and best. I want what's best in my life. What does God tell us to do? What does God give us? There are some issues that we cannot abandon or walk away from. Listen, you'll never hear me say, as long as you believe in God, you're saved. And if you believe in God and you're a good person, you're going to be at the front of the line. I'm glad you believe in God, but do you believe that Jesus Christ is the very Son of God? Have you ever received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Have you ever received Him? I'll talk about that this afternoon for a moment. And we, you say, well, nowhere in God's Word does it say that you have to receive Him. I beg to differ. I'll show you that. What does the Bible teach on this? Listen, you may not enjoy the bright lights or fame or popularity associated with the world, but unmovable pleases God. I would rather please God than please man. If I am pleasing God, then I will please God's people. Not perfect, but pleasing our conduct. Finally, we are urged to be always abounding in the work of the Lord. Now this is an interesting phrase. It literally means exceeding a fixed amount, overflowing, exceeding. Our work for the Lord is not to be passive or scarce. We are to literally overflow for Him. Listen, there seems to be little problem in abounding when it comes to our desires, things that we enjoy, things that we like to do. We will abound in them. But what about the things in, that, that, that pleases God? What about the things that God wants us to do? Do we resist it? Do we argue it? Or do we embrace it and say, God, whatever you have for my life, the will and way that you have for me, that's exactly what I'm going to follow. 
You know, I think of the Flemings and, and reading the letter this morning, and, and I've known uh, Brother Fleming for a long time. I've known him for uh, over 30 years, his family. I know his heart is breaking in this decision. Why? His heart is in China. He says, well, I'm just going to stay faithful where I'm at. I'm going to keep doing the work of the Lord. And that's exactly what we need to do, our conduct here. Abounding in the work of the Lord requires much more than just attending church on Sunday. We are to be involved in handing out tracts and telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Being involved in the church. Really, it has the idea of being consumed with the Lord. It is being on fire for Him and, and going overboard for Him. Look at what Christ has done for us. All that He has given to us. God's been good to us. God has given us a wonderful life. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 15, the first part, it says, And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. The last thing here is the reward of the believer. Now listen to this. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, I move of all, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, there is a promised reward for those who are steadfast, unmovable, and always abounding in the Lord. What are the things that are promised? First of all, a peaceful life. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Listen, Paul reveals that serving the Lord and living for Him is not living a life in the dark. Well, I wonder what's going to happen in the future. I wonder what's going to happen after this life. We already know what's going to happen. We already know what's going to happen when we die as a Christian. We already know what's going to happen. And for the unsaved person, they know what's going to happen to them if they were to read God's Word. Folks, when we die, we're immediately in the presence of God, in the twinkling of an eye. We're in the presence of God. If your life were to end today, you would be the happiest person in the world. Why? Well, you'd be in the presence of God. We are not serving God in the dark. We are not serving God and not knowing what the future is. This peaceful life, we're not just aimlessly wandering in this life. We are not hoping that all of this is real and that Jesus is able to secure our salvation. Folks, we can live with full assurance that if you accepted Jesus Christ, your Savior, you're saved. There's no question. Our eternal home is heaven. There are some things that we can know in Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which has, hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his ab uh, abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto the lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In 1 Peter 1.13 it says, Wherefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end, the, the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us the blessings of serving Him. The Bible teaches us the blessings of living for Him. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, Always abounding. It's a profitable life. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know, maybe there wasn't much to rejoice about amongst the church at Corinth. And Paul is writing them and encourage them. And, and there might not be much that, they, uh, the, the, that the world thinks that they could have hope in or be excited about. But Paul's saying, listen, this is not the end of your life. There's a future for us as Christians. Aren't you glad that God's in control of everything? I was talking to <coughs> Dr. Hiltabittle, and the Bible says we're going to rule and reign with Christ. I said, so what do you think about that? And, and several things I've heard people and preachers say that, you know, we might be uh, cleaning the barns or might be in charge of a CNC machine and, and all this stuff. He says, I believe that our minds 
are in this human setting and those things won't be in the millennial. He said, we don't have a full understanding, but no, we are not going to be doing the labor. We're going to rule and reign with Christ. Someone else gets to mow the lawn. Can I get a witness? Can I get an amen for that? Maybe you'll even say, you're going to use the one with blades. No motor on that one. But you say, where do you find that God's Word teaches it? The Bible says we're going to be rewarded for our works. The Bible says that we're encompassed by so great a cloud of witnesses encouraging us. The Bible teaches us what's going to happen to the lost. But folks, we are not walking around this world aimlessly. It is a profitable life. Listen, I'm convinced that the average Christian feels overlooked and unappreciated. I'm convinced of that. But God doesn't forget. God keeps track of everything. God knows everything that we do. The Bible says we're not going to be judged in accordance to our sins. We're going to be judged in, in, in the sort of our work, our works. Aren't you glad God's not going to look at the sins, but He's going to look at all we've done for Him? Folks, I want to be faithful to the Lord. Listen, you may feel as if you have contributed little to the cause of Christ. May I encourage you, just press on. I like what Dr. Hiltabittle, and we were talking uh, away from church, we were talking about many things, and he says, I believe that we can't even begin. He said, the reason that the marriage supper of the Lamb is at the end of the, uh, 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 of the really seven years, he says, because all that we have done, he says, we have no clue. Only God knows. The lives that you have touched, the people that you have touched. Think about it. If you led someone to Christ, you told them about the Lord and and they receive Christ as their Savior, and you haven't seen them maybe since that day, I wonder how many people maybe they've led to Christ. I wonder how many people they have touched. That's all interest on your account. Only God knows. What are we to do? I pray that if God tarry His coming, that when we are raptured out of here, God will find a church, New Hope Baptist Church, that is steadfast, unmovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord. So what happens when the rapture takes place? What happens to all this? Who cares? They can have it all. They'll find some Bibles. They'll find some tracts. Maybe they can take that and lead some people to Christ if they've never heard the gospel. Folks, we just need to be steadfast, unmovable. You know, are you glad for the relationship that you have with the Lord? Let me ask you, are you glad for the relationship you have with the Lord, but also with your brethren? You know, I couldn't think of any greater people. I don't know about you. I've got a close family. I love my family. But I've never been part of anything like this, the church. We are so blessed from the Lord. Let's just keep on keeping on. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Lord, I pray that you help us to never, ever turn and go a different direction, that we will stay strong for you. Lord, I know where my convictions are, but I pray that the young people and, and the younger here, even young married couples in college age, that they will be steadfast, unmovable, and they won't look at what the world has to offer or, or even religious institutions that have church above their name that, that are uh, seeker-friendly and a type of church, but they will stand strong on your word, upon the doctrines. They'll get a conviction in their life that doesn't change. Lord, if a conviction changes, it wasn't a conviction, it was a preference. Lord, I pray that we'll stay strong for you. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, nobody's looking around. Maybe someone here this morning said, Pastor, would you pray?